The Maiden of the Forest by Pumpkin Moose 22. Chapter 3. The clangs and shouts echoed around the practice room were dull in Kit's ears for his thoughts were occupied with whether or not his maiden had found the roses and the note he had left for her. It had only been a few hours, but he couldn't help but wonder if she had already passed through the woods. He thought of her kindness, her goodness, her vigour. She was so spirited. He longed again to know who she was. Why didn't he press her for a name? A blade landed against his shoulder, pulling him from his thoughts. Wake up, your royal highness, you're in a daze, Captain Alistair said. I'm sorry, Kit muttered, pulling away from the captain's rapier resting on his shoulder. You've been off since the hunt, the captain commented, silently knowing the source of Kit's recent behaviour. It's that wonderful girl, Kit confirmed. I can't stop thinking about her. Well, there are plenty of pretty girls, the captain teased, but her spirit, her goodness. You don't suppose she has a sister, do you? Captain Alistair interrupted teasingly as the two began to walk away from the practice room. Kit chuckled. I don't know. I don't know anything about her. Perhaps your mystery girl may come to the ball. Is that why you threw the doors open, is it not? Captain, it was for the benefit of the people, Kit chided, though we knew the captain wasn't fooled. He pulled off his white glove, handing it to a servant flanking his right. Of course. How shallow of me. Captain Alistair inwardly smiled while drying his brow with a towel he had removed from the arm of a servant walking silently beside him. And if she comes, then what? Kit asked, unable to stop himself from seeking his dear friend's guidance. Then you will tell her you are a prince, and a prince may take whichever breed he wishes. Kit removed the towel from his servant's arm and then scoffed. Ha! Ha! Yes, ha! Kit repeated, wiping his forehead with the towel. You know my father and the Grand Duke will only have me marry a princess. Captain Alistair sensed to the hidden distress behind his prince's words. Trying to discourage him, he said, Well, if this girl from the forest is as charming as you say, they may change their minds. That is my hope, Kit muttered. My father is very concerned about mine and the kingdom's safety. He merely wants to make sure you are taken care of, Captain Alistair said as the two continued wandering down the halls in their grey fencing uniforms. This, I know, Kit sighed, coming to a halt at the end of the hall. Captain Alistair stopped next to him, smiling understandingly. If I be so bold, your highness, I think that in time your father will soften his view and lean in to favour where your heart currently lies. Kit glanced at him. Am I that obvious? Captain Alistair let out a hearty laugh. His act telling Kit the answer was yes, he said. Don't be upset, sire. It is wonderful to see that you are in love, the captain said gently. Captain Kit smiled despite himself. I never thought I would ever be. It often happens when you least expect it. Could this really be love, though? Kit wondered. I confess I've never felt this way before about anyone. I am not one to be an expert, Highness. But if your thoughts are constantly occupied and your every act is taken objective to satisfy your cravings of the one occupying your thoughts, I'd say it was love. Your constant sighs and glazed eyes also indicate this. I haven't sighed constantly, Kit said defensively. Captain Alistair merely grinned. If you say so, your highness. Kit frowned. I'm going to take a bath. The captain's amused chuckles followed him as he turned away and with slightly darkened cheeks. Had he really been sighing all day? Sure, he was constantly dazing, but... He'd only met the girl yesterday. Surely he couldn't fall in love with someone in a day, right? Kit wandered down the hall towards his room. He desperately wanted to talk to someone. No, he desperately wanted to talk to his father. But his father was currently dealing with state business and wouldn't be able to see him until dinner. They had done in the past on a few occasions. It wouldn't hurt to bring up the idea. Besides... He didn't think he'd be able to rest until he talked to his father about the strange feelings swirling within his breast. Making up his mind, he entered his chambers and pulled the rope next to the door. A maid, hearing the call, rushed in. Sire? she curtsied. Kit smiled. Would you please fetch Henry and Lance for me? Of course, sire, she said, curtsying again. Kit studied her for a moment. Miss, may I have your name? It is Crystal, your highness. Are you new to the palace? Yes, sire. She answered, surprised. I just started yesterday. 
Well then, welcome, and it is a pleasure to meet you, Crystal. Crystal's slightly freckled cheeks darkened as she swiped a stray lock of brown hair away from her bright green eyes. I have heard of your goodness, Highness, but I didn't think it would be so genuine. Kit raised an amused eyebrow. And why not? he asked. Crystal kept her eyes averted as she mumbled. I am but a servant. And I recognise that you and the rest of the servants play a key role in ensuring the palace runs smoothly. Credit should be given where credit is due. Your kindness is appreciated, Highness, Crystal said, curtsying. Now, please allow me to return it by seeking Henry and Lance out for you. Thank you, Kit said. Crystal left the room. Have courage and be kind. Kit smiled, even now his mystery girl was influencing him. You asked for us, Highness? Lance asked, breaking Kit from his thoughts. He hadn't even realised he'd gotten lost in them. Remembering himself, Kit shook his head. Yes, I did. In need of another bath, sir? Henry guessed with a slight smile. Kit looked at them apologetically. I am afraid so. I apologise for making you repeat the task in one day. No need to apologise, sir, Lance assured. We guessed you would be in need of, of another like, once you asked us to alar alert the captain of fencing this morning. I'll have the hot water drawn up in no time. Thank you, Kit said, both bowing to them. Could I also indulge you to send a request to my father? I wish to dine privately with him tonight if he is able. I will ensure the message reaches him, Henry offered. Kit nodded gratefully after he pulled off his boots. He walked barefoot out to the balcony again as both Henry and Lance left to accomplish their tasks. He focused on the distant woods. Had she found the roses yet? After his bath, Kit spent the next two hours in the library, leisurely reading books that didn't truly capture his interest. He flipped idly through a book, no longer paying attention to the tale, since one of the characters possessing golden hair and brown eyes immediately made him think of the girl in the forest. He sighed, but then frowned when he caught himself. I don't believe it, he muttered, rubbing his eyes. Alistair was right. Your Highness? Kit started, sitting up straight to find Henry staring at him curiously. Henry, you startled me. My apologies. He bowed. You seemed lost in thought. Kit shook his head. I fear that is becoming a habit as of late. Henry heard of the prince's departure through the west gate from multiple servants he'd passed in the halls. He was rather curious who the roses were for, like everyone else, but he had enough tact not to pry. Though he couldn't deny he suspected the source of the prince's strange behaviour was a fine young lady. Why else would he leave the palace with a bouquet? Coming out of his thoughts, Henry spoke the reason for his presence. His Majesty the King has agreed to your dinner proposal, sire. He is actually waiting for you to join him in the dining room. Kit blinked. Kit blinked, looking to the window nearest him. The sun was indeed low, oranges, reds and pinks swirling across the sky in clouds like a fine canvas. I didn't realise the lateness of the hour, Kit muttered. Thank you, Henry, for relaying the message. Any time, sire, Henry bowed before leaving the room. Kit got up and replaced the books he had taken from the shelves, before heading down to the dining room where his father sat waiting for him. The king sent him a rather curious glance when he entered the room. Kit, you asked to see me, for me to join you for private dinner, but I find you missing from the dining table. Where have you been, my boy? Kit smiled apologetically as he sat down on the right side of his father. I have been lost in my thoughts, mostly, he confessed, as the servants began setting hot, fresh food on the table. And what is occupying your thoughts? King Rowan asked, though he suspected he already knew the answer. Father, what does romantic love feel like? King Robin blinked several times. He had been expecting his son to go off on another episode of trying to marry a good, honest country girl instead of a princess. Why do you ask? The king wondered. Kit pushed his spoon around the fresh beef stew before him. You loved mother before you married her. I loved her the second I saw her, the king corrected. How did you know it was love, though? Kit asked. King Rowan smiled. Kit, when you are in love, you tend to act a little differently than what is considered normal. The second I met your mother, I found it hard to speak properly and embarrassed myself by stepping on her dress several times after asking her to dance. Mind you, she also stepped repeatedly on my toes since she wasn't the most elegant dancer. 
Kit and his father chuckled at Rory. It was the truth. Uh, what about after your first meeting? Kit asked. Well, King Rowan muttered, sitting back while munching on a piece of bread. I honestly couldn't get her out of my head. I kept reliving every moment I spent with her, and I had an undeniable longing to see her again. The day after the ball where we met, I went out of my way to ask her on a picnic and she happily obliged. We courted for another month before we finally went to our parents to request being married. The rest is history. But you knew from the beginning that you were in love with her, Kit prompted. King Rowan chuckled. Why, yes, son. Are you worried you won't be able to love one of the princesses that will attend the ball? Kit swallowed. He didn't want to just yet confess his feelings to his father towards about the girl in the forest for fear they would be dismissed. Maybe, he muttered, unable to meet his father's eyes. King Rowan reached across the table and patted his son's hand. Kit, love is an interesting thing. Some people have to work really hard to find it, while others have it stumbled upon them unexpectedly. What happened to me and your mother was rare, and I confess it may not happen for you. You have to marry for advantage in order to ensure the safety of our kingdom, which means love may have to come later. How can you ask me to not marry for love? Kit demanded, slightly upset he would be denied something his father had not been. Your situation is different than mine, son, King Rowan said tiredly. Please do not argue with me on this. The only thing keeping me here is the anxiety of leaving you alone. I don't know how much longer I can fight my illness, but I am quite determined to make sure you at least have a chosen bride before I pass. Kit sobered immediately, clasping his father's hand and, and he sighed. Must we speak of such sadness? This may very well be a passing illness. The words were spoken without hope. Kit, King Rowan chided declinedly. You are very close to becoming your own man. Sacrifice and acceptance of things you cannot change is part of being a good king. I know this, Kit replied. But can I not voice my thoughts? By all means, King Rowan invited. I myself have done so on many countless occasions, but know that all that they can ever be, in the end, you won't be able to prevent what is inevitable. I understand, Kit muttered. Now, let us discuss something lighter, the king said, deciding the subject was closed. The two of them conversed on several matters of state for the rest of the dinner. Kit left with a, mu with a full stomach, but a rather dissatisfied spirit. Sighing, something he now realised he was going to do all the time, he once more wandered outside to the palace gardens until he had reached a large fountain flowing with crystal clear water. Off to the right was a lovely footbridge, standing over a small stream that trickled around through the grass. Its path guided by solid white rocks. Kit sat down on the edge of the fountain and stared at the water without really seeing it. A small cough made him jump. He twisted around. Standing before him was an elderly woman. Her deep brown dress was nothing like he had ever seen. The fabrics appeared to look like a tree. She was leaning heavily on her staff. Though her face was weathered, her eyes were full of mischief and life. Though it was odd to see someone, he did not know that in this particular section of the ground, Kit decided it would be best to be a gentleman. The woman didn't appear to be a threat after all. He rose to, immediately to his feet. My lady, what brings you to the palace at this late hour? The woman smiled, taking a few steps forward. I was merely dropping off a few things in the kitchen, dear, and decided to satisfy my desire of seeing the palace gardens. I have heard they are rather enchanting. And do you find them so? Kit asked, offering her a seat next to him. The woman hobbled over. Kit helped her lower herself down onto the large stone lip of the fountain's edge. Thank you, she muttered. Before looking around at the romantic scene, I think it passes my expectations. I am glad to hear it, Kit grinned, puzzled but amused by this strange woman. She minded him of someone, but he didn't know who. So, what is a strapping young man like you doing wandering around a garden past twilight? I am a little lost, he admitted. 
Well, the castle is to your left and the exit to the city is just on the other side of those trees. She answered, pointing. Kit chuckled. I appreciate the directions, madam. Yes, but I suppose the real question you're looking for is advice, the woman said, picking her slightly dirty fingernails. Kit stared. Oh, did I know that you were in need of advice? She interrupted. Simply, dear. It is plainly written all over your face. Kit shook his head, completely and utterly perplexed. I must admit, madam, you have left me speechless. Oh, I doubt that. Since you are still able to talk, she said cheerfully. Kit laughed. He liked this woman. In her own way, she was quite charming. So, what's on your mind? Hmm? Kit immediately sobered at the thought of the conversation he had just had with his father, the girl from the forest and the pressures of being placed on him to marry for advantage and not love. He sighed a heavy sigh. My father is ill. I am terribly sorry to hear that, the woman said sincerely. There is nothing I can do to prevent what is to come, but all I can do is try to give him the happiness he seeks. Kit muttered. He desires that I marry as soon as possible. You might say I am being pressured into it. That tends to happen in this day and age, the woman muttered. Yes, well, I confess I am rather distressed over the whole situation. You want to marry the one you love, she guessed. Kit jerked his head as he looked at her. She displayed a yawning smile and her eyes danced. How do you know I'm in love? It's plain to see, she said gently. It is? Kit asked, frightened that a stranger could see this. He had been surprised enough to disclose, to discover his emotions were completely open to Captain Alistair's view. Had his father seen it too? The Grand Duke? The entire palace staff? He ran a hand through his hair nervously. The old woman patted his arm. It is nothing to be ashamed of, my boy. And it is only obvious to those who live for love. What do you mean? Kit wondered, intrigued. Those who long for and live in love see when others are in a similar state or those whose thoughts are clouded by other means, such as entitlements, security, money, and greed, will be unable to see it. Are you implying that my father is misguided? Kit asked, a tad defensively. Ill-advised whispers can sometimes cause one's views to become murky, the woman answered. It is up to those who see, still see clearly to make those views plain once more. Kit frowned and scrunched up his forehead. He leaned forward on his hands, his elbows resting on his knees, while he stewed over her words. He stared off into space, thinking. Drawing a conclusion some time later, the result hit him quite forcefully. You suggest I follow my heart and marry for love, despite my father's wishes? He turned, but to his astonishment, the old woman who had been so clearly sitting beside him was now nowhere to be found. Bewildered, Kit stood and looked around. The grounds were empty. Madam, he called, but the only sounds were those of the crickets mixing with the laughter of the steady stream of the fountain's water behind him. Kit wandered the area in slight concern, but after another ten minutes, he drew the conclusion she must have simply slipped off without his notice. Frowning, he decided to retire for the night. When wondering where on earth the woman could have gone, and how he could possibly do what she suggested, Making his way into the castle, he thought of how he had been completely charmed by the girl he had met yesterday. Perhaps his father and the Grand Duke would be equally charmed if she was to come to the ball. Then he could marry for love and not advantage. Filled with this hope, he wondered again if she had found the flowers he had left for her. Maybe she had found them and left a note herself, for him as a response. He could slip away from his duties during lunch tomorrow. It was only an hour's journey or out to the forest after all. Captain Alistair would no doubt tease him, but Kit couldn't surpass the desire, the desire of longing to return to the woods. His mind made up. He entered the palace and made for the captain's private chambers. Captain, he called, throwing the doors open despite the lateness of the hour. Good heavens, Kit. No. Captain Alistair cried, dropping his book he was reading. He had been lounging on his bed, enjoying the solitude of the evening permitted. His chest was bare, his legs covered in a pair of loose trousers. What is the matter? 
he asked, leaping to his feet despite his comical dress. Kit fought down a chuckle at having caught the captain in such attire. Relax, Alistair. I've merely come to request something of you. The captain sent him with an expression of amusement. And what might that request be, Kit? Will you journey with me to the forest tomorrow, shortly after noon? Captain Alistair frowned. Kit, you can't keep wandering away to the forest. You'll cause an even bigger stir among the servants and the guard than you already have. What do you mean? Kit asked, confused. The captain walked over to the open doors and closed them, enveloping the two in privacy. Your display at the west gate, with a huge bouquet of the finest roses from the palace gardens, did not go unnoticed. The whispers are you went out to meet a lovely young lady. Well, the rumours weren't far off, Kit said, undisturbed by the news. Palace gossip was unavoidable, and Kit knew the servants didn't share stories out of spite, but had something to converse about as they worked. Kit, if this was to meet the ears of the Grand Duke or your father, Captain Alistair began, but Kit cut him off. Alistair, there is no need to worry of these things. Almost all of the gossip that runs through this castle never becomes known to the Grand Duke or my father. Goodness, you don't have to tell me what everyone said. I'm sure it would just be as in the dark as they were. The kit captain shook his head, bothered. I see you will continue to be optimistic concerning this, no matter what I say. Fine, if you decide to go to the forest again, I shall accompany you. Kit grinned. Thank you, Alistair. Despite himself, Captain Alistair chuckled. You have never been this reckless in all the years I've known you. Perhaps I should try to keep you from this woman. The more I see you, the more I suspect she cast you under a spell. The only spell she has cast is awakening the natural dormant feelings I reserved for her. Kit replied. Such a romantic, the captain teased. Kit placed his hand along the cross's chest and lightly bowed in playfully. And I pray this does not lessen your opinion of me. Captain Alistair rolled his eyes. We should both get some sleep. There is much to do tomorrow. Thank you, my friend. I promise in the future I will try not to be so reckless. I doubt that you can be, your highness. The captain teased. Kit merely grinned. Good night, Alistair. Good night, Kit. End of chapter three. Hi, guys. Hope you enjoyed this. That's a nice little thing. I also like that he met the fairy godmother. Spoiler alert. <laughs> anyway, yeah, that's really nice. I like that this is a romance told from the male's perspective. I don't really read those much, so it's nice to see. I'm not really one for rom-com books. Anyway, remember to like, comment and subscribe and hit that bell to get notified for whenever I upload a new video. Have a good day, night or whatever time zone you're in. Bye, my guys, gals and non-binary pals. I'll see you in another chapter. Bye.